Hi everyone, welcome to Hot Seat with Cognizant Clay. I am your host, Clayton Terrio. Today on the show we have David Onley. David is the former Lieutenant Governor of Ontario who served from 2007 to 2014. He is also a former news anchor with City TV and Breakfast Television. Currently, David is a professor of political sciences of University of Toronto Scarborough. I hope you guys enjoy it. Well, again, thank you so much. I do appreciate it. It's it's an honor to You're talk welcome. to you again. Likewise. Definitely. So just to start off, how have you been doing during the quarantine? Um, that's a very good question. Um, it, um, I had a very serious surgery last November uh, where it was discovered that I had a, a brain tumor in my right frontal lobe. And it required emergency surgery, which was a complete success. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Um, and that after about six weeks, sort of start of the new year, a whole therapy program began at the rehab, uh, Rumsey Rehab Center. And um, that was, was going very well. It's a tremendous facility. Uh, but then, of course, COVID hit and everything was shut down. And, uh, of course, along with that meant all the follow-up tests at the Sunnybrook Hospital where the surgery took place. And um, again, the whole rehab process um, at uh, Rumsey Center. So it uh, kind of derailed things, uh, if I can be very candid. But um, at the same time, um, much of the recovery is like a mental recovery, a, a physic, a mentally recovering your mental capabilities, if we can put it that way. And so I was fortunately able to get back to teaching at the U of T Scarborough, where I teach two courses, um, one, both of them senior seminar courses, one of them, the uh, politics of disability, which is really fascinating this uh, time of life, and um, especially with going on with COVID. And uh, then drawing upon my experience as Lieutenant Governor, um, I also teach a course um, on the Vice Regal Office in Canada. So I got back to teaching in mid-February, just at about the same time that the rehab process came to a halt, at least rehab in terms of uh, formal. Um, so it, it's been quite disruptive in that sense. On the other hand, um, it really encouraged me to spend a lot of time doing research, and I continue to do it every day, on the impact that COVID is having on people with disabilities. because. Uh, we know, sadly, that uh, over 80% of all the fatalities in the country uh, have occurred with that group of people we collectively call seniors, but the majority of those people were individuals with disabilities living in seniors' homes, uh, or people who were not seniors but lived in long-term care facilities. And these two locations, these two facilities have just been uh, brutally assaulted. And uh, the research that I've done uh, really has indicated, and I've, I presented this, by the way, about a month and a half ago to a House of Commons committee on the impact of uh, government programs in treating COVID as it pertained to uh, people with disabilities. And um, I made the observation that you know, this was an avoidable tragedy in many, many ways. Because as you look at the statistics uh, from the uh, maritime provinces, uh, since March 8th, which was the first death of a Canadian uh, from COVID, uh, there's been a total of 88 people dying in the maritimes from COVID. And you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, why is it that these people, these four provinces, we're able to bring it under control, uh, whereas it's you know now well over 8,600 people nationwide. Um, and the answer is the same answer as to the more than 100 seniors' homes in the province of Ontario uh, who have not recorded a single fatality. Uh, and in both instances, whether it's the homes uh, in Ontario that have had an absolute zero fatality rate, or the maritime provinces with a total of 88 uh, since March. In, in each case, what happened, and I'll use a specific example to illustrate the point, and that's um, Shepherd Village, a senior's facility of 900 people, 
in Toronto uh, on Shepherd, uh, right near Midland Avenue. And um, in early January, their management team figured it out. They took the conclusion or reached the conclusion um, that this was going to be a very serious event. This is not going to be like another round of the flu or something like that. And so they shut the place down. They locked it down. They instructed their uh, staff, the PSWs, who rotated through into other houses, uh, other homes, that sh I should say, and houses of patients. Um, and that, by the way, is a separate story uh, and part of the problem um, you know, facing us today. Um, and said to them, you cannot go and work anywhere else. You can only work here. 20% of their staff quit because of that. And there was no hard feelings. Those individuals had to have the extra money. But by doing that, the extra workload was put on the remaining 80% of the staff, but they were trained to do things that they hadn't done before and therefore upgraded their skills. And in the process, um, zero deaths occurred. So you say to yourself, well, if, that senior's home, uh, another one in Scarborough called the Wexford, um, which is at Florence and, um, and Pharmacy area in Scarborough, which interestingly enough was founded by my late parents in the very early 1970s. And ironically, the Claremont, which is in downtown Toronto at uh, uh, Mount Pleasant and Davisville area, um, my mother, ended up for a variety of reasons in the final years of her life in the Claremont. So the Wexford, the Claremont, and Shepherd Village all had zero fatalities, but they all took the same action. It was the same action that the Maritime Provinces took. So do, take that reality into account. Look at the 81% uh, of the fatalities who are seniors and disabled persons, and you say to yourself, this didn't have to happen not in the same numbers, not over 8,600. And it, it's wonderful to be able to say that we stand about 14th in the world right now in terms of deaths per million. Um, but there are a lot of countries who are doing far, far better uh, than we are. And intriguingly, one of them is Japan. Uh, Japan has 126 million people. We have 37 and a half million people. So they have three and a half times the population that Canada does, but their number of fatalities instead of 8,600 plus is about 900. And you say, well, how did that happen? And the answer is similar to what happened at the nursing homes and senior homes here in Toronto that had zero deaths and the Maritimes. And that is that they lock things down a lot sooner. Um, they don't shake hands, by the way. That's a bit of an outlier. Of course, they bow. Uh, that's something that goes back to the 14th century in Japan. And, you know, you think about it and go, yeah, I guess, you know, we've grown up shaking hands. If you're a little kid and you shook hands with a, an adult, you kind of felt you're kind of getting big because you could shake hands, you know. And it's been a social construct that we've had for, for centuries in North America and, and throughout uh, the European community, if you will, uh, and throughout much of the world. But there's no particular reason that we have to. And the Japanese chose not to. So with three and a half times the population of Canada, they've got 13% of the fatalities. And one of the other reasons that they've, and not the only one, but five years ago, they began a program above and beyond what we would consider to be Canada Pension Plan or old age security. And everybody has to buy into it. And what that goes to, and it's a pretty significant amount, I don't have the number off the top of my head right now, but it's a fair amount of your tax dollar. But what it goes to exclusively is to provide quality housing for seniors in their latter years. So you can work through your career and whether you're a raging success or whether or not you have one difficulty after another, you know that you're not going to end up, you know, dumped into an inadequate facility. And, and sadly, you know, far too many of our um, 
our seniors and persons with disabilities, uh, like my my wife's first cousin, who you know is in his mid fifties, and because of his physical circumstances, his condition, um, he's lived in a senior citizen's home since he was in his forties, which is you know really inappropriate. It's too bad. So I guess the bottom line, a very long introduction to the conversation here, but I, I guess the bottom line is. It's all great, well, and good to say, you know, we really, really want to get back to normal. I, I understand that. I'd love to go see a Blue Jays game. I, you know, hope the Leafs win in the playoffs. I'd love to see a game there. Love to go to the movie theater. Love to go just to the mall to shop, to, you know, see other people. Many friends of mine that I only see on weekends at the mall. Um, but, you know, we can't just let ourselves go back to normal because, Normal is what got us into this mess. So we really must have a better normal if we're to avoid this ever happening again. Definitely, and, and very long-winded, but very informative. So thank you, because that, that it is very important to, to focus on that for sure. Yeah. Um, so, so for my guests who don't know, you were diagnosed with polio at three yeah. years old. That's and right. then after extensive rehab, you know, you gained a, like most of your arm and hand movements and some of your leg movements. Just, just, yeah. Can you just talk me through the challenges you're presented with due to polio? Um, the main challenge, oddly enough, is not something that you can see or that I can see, but it's a, something that I experience not every day, but a lot. And that is something called post-polio fatigue syndrome. And it, it typically begins... 10 years after the onset of the condition. So for me, it was 1953 when I got polio. I was born in 1950. Um, and I can remember very clearly for the first time in grade eight, it was the last day of grade eight um, in 1964. So it was just, you know, 10 years and a bit after the onset. Uh, a lot of people, friends coming over to play and in our, our backyard. And we did for a little while. And then I just said, you know, I'm sorry, guys. I've just got to go in for a few minutes. And they thought I was going in to get a drink or something like that. But I went into my bedroom and I had to lay down because I, I had just been hit by a wall of fatigue. And I remember as a kid, 13 years of age, almost 14 at that point, thinking to myself at that very moment, I can think of it right now, thinking um, something's really wrong. I, like it's the middle of the afternoon. You know, school was let out early. I shouldn't. I shouldn't be feeling tired like this. I shouldn't have to be laying down. And it began a process that uh, carried on for another, close to another 20 years until my mid thirties, when, uh, and fatigue was a large part of the issue. Uh, as I went through university, I could only study a certain level. I did one year of law school, dropped out. And the reason I dropped out was more than anything else, I simply did not, have the physical stamina to study uh, law. And of course, you know, as you well know, um, law school is a grind. It's, it's one of the heaviest grinds you can imagine. And I can remember meeting with the uh, contracts professor, Professor Manzig, great guy. Um, and we got talking about how I was really encountering some difficulties in his course. And he said, you're, you're just gonna have to work harder. And he said, uh, at this point, it's not a matter of impact, it's a matter of stamina. And at that very moment, I knew that my legal career was over, that I, I was not gonna be able to return. And so I've been blessed um, by working uh, primarily at City TV, where some of the days were very long, but most of the days were very concentrated in terms of energy expenditure. So, you know, if you're a reporter, most days you didn't, really need to be there until the lunch hour. You know, you'd get your story, you'd go out, you'd shoot it, you'd have it done by six o'clock and you'd come home. A lot of days it was a lot longer than that, but those were the exceptions. So uh, post polio has been with me all of my life. And it's uh, very much for those that uh, not encountered it before, you know, we think of our vehicles and we go to the gas station and we fill them up get more energy into the car through lots of gasoline and away we go. Um, if you're like me, who uses an electric scooter or an electric wheelchair, 
uh, when your batteries run down, uh, you just got to stop, you got to plug in, you got to wait. And post polio fatigue, like many other fatigue syndromes, is very much like batteries. When your batteries start to wear down, you have no alternative, you have to stop. And you have to plug in, and in the sense of get some rest, and then recharge. And that can really be a controlling factor in your life. Um, so you, you just have to be cautious. You just have to plan your days. And if you know that you're gonna have a really busy day, like we did on June 7th when our youngest son got married and because of COVID, we had to do it with a small ceremony in our backyard and everything went well, but we knew it was gonna be a big day. And so on June 8th, the day after, we did nothing, <laughs> you know, and I, I was very grateful to do nothing because of that. So that's been the experience. The rest of it has been just the reality of getting older. I just turned 70, hard for me to believe that. I think that's the first time I've said that publicly, but I turned 70 on June 12th. And um, so, you know, as we get older, we lose muscle power and that's, that's just reality. We have more aches and pains and uh, I'm certainly experiencing that. Uh, although, you know, really when I see so many friends, associates, um, you know, have far, far more severe health problems uh, than I do. I've, I've been, you know, I mean, other than a couple of kidney stone attacks decades ago, which is not nice, um, and uh, obviously the onset of this um, uh, meningioma is the name of the, the tumor on the right frontal lobe. Um, I mean, that's certainly been the defining experience medically of my life, uh, other than polio, uh, because I survived it, you know, I mean, more than anything else, because I survived, because it, right. it can kill you. And uh, I came very, very close to dying. They said that when I got onto the operating table, I was only uh, three or four hours away from dying. So it was, it was a race to get it, to get it done. I must also tell you something kind of funny. Um, you can have humor even in the, the grimmest moments. So, um, you know, I was operated on by Dr. Leo DaCosta of um, uh, Sunnybrook, uh, one of the great, great, literally great brain surgeons in the country. And uh, so I'd met him. I, you know, I knew about him, or I was told about him. I, and excuse me, I realized now, no, I had not met him before the surgery, but I've been told about him that he was one of the very best. And um, and this was a right frontal lobe tumor that had to be removed. It was the size of an orange, hard to believe. Um, and so I get into the little area outside of um, the operating room. It's like an ante room, if you will. And the anesthetist comes up to me. Uh, a French Canadian guy and uh, a slight accent, and uh, introduces himself, shows me the papers that I have to sign to, you know, give them permission to uh, operate, literally. And um, he has this binder, small binder, and he flips it open and he's, he's looking down. He says, So, um, so we are here today to remove a growth from your spine. And I, my eyes just went wide and I said, no, 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 not at all. <laughs> we are here today to get a tumor removed from my right frontal lobe. And he flipped the page and he said, oh, oh yes, um, you're no longer the second operation of the day. You're the first. And I said, yes, I am. So um, we, I, I had to laugh. I, I really did. And I didn't, I wasn't worried about it because I knew that, no, Dr. DaCosta does not remove, remove growths off people's spines. He operates on brains, you know, so he would have figured that out pretty quickly. Besides, there is no growth on my spine. So, um, you know, that, as I say, you, you got to laugh at uh, even in the, in the grim moments. I'm just great, grateful that notwithstanding the sedatives and everything else that I had the wherewithal to, to say that. So adventures Definitely. continue. Yeah, and I, I think it's a good bedside manner to have a sense of humor. All my doctors... Yeah always say something funny to make you feel better and it definitely yeah. helps. Yeah, and um, vice versa. So, yeah, definitely. Um, so with those challenges, I was just wondering, like I always ask my guests, who were some of the main people in your life that helped you through those things? Oh, that's good. Well, a number of them certainly 
uh, family members, uh, my grandfather, my father, my mother, um, you know, family members that just encouraged me. Um, there, and I mean, as a kid, you know, uh, being a big Maple Leaf fan, uh, Johnny Bauer was my great hero. And, uh, you know, he, boy, he stayed around for a long, long time. And uh, as, uh, as Lieutenant Governor, one of the, the most amazing things, other than giving you your award, um, was giving Johnny Bauer a Senior Citizens Award. And I, I can remember the moment so clearly thinking, you know, how cool is this? Um, you know, here's my childhood idol, my hero, and I'm giving him an award. <laughs> so uh, it really was quite a moment. But um, yeah, those uh, people, uh, and I, I think also a priest, because I had my surgeries in uh, St. Joseph's Hospital as a kid, uh, 1960, and then again in 1962. And um, his name was Father Belanger. And he was a great guy with a great sense of humor. And the kids on the ward um, used to just love it when he came on the scene, when he would drop by for a visit, because he he played practical jokes. He, you know, kept people uh, loose. He, he knew your, what your condition was. Uh, he took the time to know that, okay, this kid has got this and this kid has got that. And I can remember, geez, I'm trying to remember now, it must have been 1960. There was a, a night where I had had the surgery. It was painful. And of course, back then, you know, 1960, that's getting to be uh, a long time ago and medicines weren't anywhere near as effective as they are today. And um, it, it was at night, it was raining, and I was feeling down, I was really was. Father Belanger came into the room at night, it was a real surprise, because he almost never came in uh, in the evening. It was always daytime that he'd do the visiting. And uh, I was quite surprised to see him, and he asked me how I was doing, and I said, well, not too well. You know, he said, would you, you know, want me to get a nurse? And I said, no, I'm just feeling, you know, it just kind of hurts. And he looked at the chart and said, well, you've had medication. And, all this. and then he said, do you know where I've just come from? I said, no. And he said, well, I've just come from a couple of stairs, floors above you here in the hospital. And I've just been with a man who's dying. Oh, you know, I'm 10 years old. That kind of hits you. And he says, I'm here to tell you, you're not dying tonight. <coughs> Blew me away, just blew me away. He said, you're gonna live a long, long time. And I, you know, as a kid, 10 years old, that's all I needed to hear that night from that man. So, uh, you know, I know that there's been a lot of controversies with, uh, you know, Catholic priests uh, with, in terms of, you know, abuse and things like that. And I, I mean, all of that's just ghastly, it's terrible. Uh, it's not just the Catholic church, sadly, that it's, you know, restricted to. Um, but when I, I see those stories or hear them on the news or something, I think about, I go, well, yeah, but you didn't know Father Belanger. You know, he, he, I think he represented the majority. So um, I would say that and a minister, Dr. Reverend Gordon Allen, um, he just passed away uh, just this past year. He was a fine, fine gentleman. And uh, so, you know, he visited me in the hospital in, in times when my parents couldn't and I actually was allowed to accompany me right up to the doorway of the uh, operating room before going in and as a little kid you're just you know you're just terrified you don't know what's going on and uh, you know they were the, 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 the nursing staff and the doctors they were but especially the nurses they were you know they were encouraging and they were trying to support you and everything but they, they knew you're scared silly you don't know what's happening you just don't and um so uh, gordon allen was a great man uh led me to my first understanding of uh, uh christian faith and um basically led me to an acceptance of uh, the lord as my personal savior he's gone now but you know you think back um i have of all of the individuals who have had a positive impact in your life and he's certainly one of them and he, and one of the most key individuals outside of my parents. So it's interesting, you know, a Baptist minister and a Catholic priest in, in separate, separate roles in one sense, uh, but each having a tremendous impact. The other thing that Gordon Allen did for me when I was in hospital is he brought me a book um, on 
uh, Sherlock Holmes. And it was a collection of Sherlock Holmes stories. And that began a lifelong interest in mystery, mystery novels and mystery, mystery movies more than novels, to be perfectly frank. And it's one of the key reasons that I uh, I've always been a huge fan of the Murdoch mysteries um, because Murdoch is very much like Sherlock Holmes. And uh, so, you know, all these people, uh, you know, who, and, and teachers as well that I can think of too, that, you know, have a role to play. And I, I think, if, you know, if you think back to your own life, there are all these key people that just popped in at the, at the right moment and uh, teachers especially, and I can think of many too many to, to mention at the, at the moment, but they, they each had a very key role to play. Uh, and sometimes very briefly, other times for many, many years, it'd stay in touch, um, you know, but uh, um, yeah, so those are some of the, the, the key people in my life. Definitely, and, and there always is somebody, and like you say, it's oftentimes when you least expect it, someone just comes into your life and they, they make such a big impact that you never forget them, whether you know them for 30 years or five minutes, it doesn't matter. So just fast forwarding a little bit, so you attended yeah. the University of Toronto Scarborough, and you yeah. obtained your degree in political sciences. I'm very curious to know why why political science and, and what was it about it that that got your attention you know that's very interesting by the way i'm just getting a battery warning here uh, clayton so i'm plugging my computer in that's so, okay uh, I, I don't want it to drop out but uh i'm not ignoring you i'm just letting you <laughs> letting you know that i just got this of course. Deep warning to tell me to plug in um yeah so let me just do that right now um I'm gonna, I've just got to turn the monitor here for a second. To yeah, yeah, no worries. Take your time. Yeah. No worries at all. I totally understand. There's always something that happens, right? Yep. yep. There. Almost. Yep. Well, it suddenly got brighter, so I, I think that's... I think it indicates it's charging. Yeah, it does. So I'm thrilled with that. Um, so how I got into political science. Um, it, it is something that I recommend to anybody starting university, and that is to um, take a, a wide range to start. And so first year university, I had no idea exactly what I wanted to take. So went to the guidance counselors and took Canadian history. I knew I liked history, so I took that. Mm -hmm. Took political science because it sounded sort of like history. I mean, that sounds silly to say, but I mean, that's literally what I thought. I took an English, I took a psychology, and I took a philosophy. So, you know, your smattering of humanities and social sciences. Well, I couldn't believe how much I enjoyed political science. It was like, wow, this is a topic I'm just fascinated by. So the second year, I, I took more political science, dropped the psychology, I think I dropped philosophy. I might have taken one more, um, maybe one more English, I think. But in any event, uh, it was at that point that my, my passion for political science uh, was born. And I was really, really fortunate to have just some excellent political science instructors. Um, and it was at a time at the U of T Scarborough in 1970 um, that was the first year that I was there. Uh, it was at a time that uh, the department was expanding. So each year that I went through school, um, there were more political science courses at Scarborough to take. And so, you know, I can remember quite eagerly waiting, I mean, everything's online now, but back then you'd wait for the, the publishing of the course calendar. And it was a you, you had to add your copy of that book. I've still got one booting around in my files here. And it brought back a lot of memories to flip through it. And you would pick the course. And then you'd have to go to the school. And you'd get the forms, and write them all out, and submit them. And then hope after, you know, hope against hope that you could get into the class. And uh, that you hadn't been, you know, maxed out. So um, that's really what it was. And so I ended up... Uh, taking a majority of my courses were political science, but it was just a, a fascination with the political process that uh, got me going there. And I, I still use 
research skills that were first started back then. You know, it's amazing for me to think about it, but it's like literally 50 years after I started, it'll be 50 years this fall that I started at UTSC and uh, a fraction of the size of the population. Now we have over 14,000 students at UTSC now. And back then I think it was barely 2,500. So, you know, it's, it's grown dramatically in, uh, in that period of time. Definitely, and I, I was Googling U of T Scarborough and it's like, yeah, 15,000 just at that campus alone. It's yeah. just, yeah. that's a lot of people for sure. So you actually started your career, 1983, in radio. And yes. my, my research tells me you did a weekly science show with CFRB's yeah. CKO, I believe, which is yeah. now defunct, which is crazy to believe. So, yeah, it is. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So you held that position for a year before City TV, which you were a weather specialist and then a host for breakfast television. What are some of your fondest memories from those times? Oh, my. Uh, many, many of them. Um, gee. Um, well, City TV, it was the camaraderie of the individuals, just overall. It was a, it was a great place to work in that regard. Um, you know, Jim McKenney, for instance, in sports had only been retired for a few years at that point. So, you know, there you are working with truly, you know, one of the a great Toronto Maple Leaf uh, who had a really quite a distinguished career. Jim McKenney is easily the funniest human being I have ever met in my life. I worked there with him for 22 years um, and he told thousands of stories, jokes, funny circumstances, events that occurred, you know, during his playing career. He never once repeated the same joke. Like it, it, just this mental Rolodex of events. He, he must have had like a photographic memory because he just pulled them out, just pull them out, pull them out one after another. And um, he always had a, a great turn of phrase and, uh, you know, I mean, it's human nature to kind of gossip a bit and say things about people. And, I, and, and Jim had this wonderful phrase, especially if he was listening to somebody and sort of on the periphery of a conversation. And so somebody would be slagging, you know, say the prime minister, just, uh, cutting, a, just cutting them a new one. And, uh, or someone really famous, you know, some major movie star or a major uh, personality. And Jim would go, I... I'm really surprised to hear you say that because I know they always speak very well of you. <laughs> and, he used to, and, he, and he, you know, he just breaks the person up because, <laughs> because of that line. So I, he was a great guy to work with. Um, uh, all the reporters, uh, you know, the majority of them were, were really good people to work with. Um, and both uh, camera operators and editors. Uh, or the ones that, you know, you really got to know and enjoy immensely. I sure did. And I, I still keep track and interact on Facebook and uh, Messenger, et cetera, with a handful of them. Because, you know, your, your other colleagues who were reporters, I mean, they had their own stories to do. And, you know, in one sense, being a reporter is a very selfish undertaking in the sense that, you really can't be worried too much about the other guy's problems or their story if it's going to hell in a handbasket. And, and it happens, it does. Um, because you had to get your story done. And that meant that you had to go out and you had to work with your camera operator and you never knew who it was gonna be from day to day. Then you get back to the station and you had to cut your story. Well, that meant you had to work with an editor and you never knew who that person was gonna be. Yeah, you just didn't know it. And like everything else, some people you get along with better than others. And, you know, some people didn't last very long in the profession. And, you know, you'd have a story and you'd go to the assignment editor and the assignment editor would say, uh, are you ready to go? Do you want to go? And they had a tough job to do because they had to keep track of where everybody was, and, you know, uh, how long they're going to need a, a camera. And um, so they'd say, so uh, I can send you out right now. And I, you, you would always ask, you'd say, okay, well, who am I going to go out with? And uh, if they said somebody that you didn't like, 
um, you had to make a split second decision of, uh, if I don't go now, uh, when could I go out? And and they, you know, the assignment editor would look at you with a very, you know, hairy eyeball and go, uh, you know, you just don't want to work with this person, do you? And I, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, but um, that was a, really the exception. The vast, vast majority of time, uh, just great, great memories of uh, really accomplished camera operators and really accomplished editors. And I learned an enormous amount about the business uh, in, in terms of working with them. And uh, so it's a very collaborative news gathering and reporting is a, a tremendously collaborative experience. It, it is the ultimate of teamwork. And uh, just as a, and, and, you know, maybe to use like the football analogy of 12 or 11 or 12 players on the field, depending on what league you're in. And, um, you know, every single player has to execute for a play to work. And it's very much like that with, uh, with news reporting and television, because there's so many people involved in the process of, of actually, you know, gathering news and, and putting it together um, that you have to work together. And that, that one person that can drop the ball, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story, a uh, perfect example of this. There's this one camera operator who for some bizarre reason didn't like to use, shoot a lot of videotape. This is back in the time of videotape. Videotape requires when you push the start button, it needs about three seconds for lockup to occur. So when you push the button, um, you're not recording actually for about three seconds. So for whatever reason, this guy liked to save tape. It wasn't his tape to save, but he just didn't like to record a lot. And so his job was to set out to uh, cover the police blowing up a package, a suspicious package. So they take it out to the, the range or whatever. He puts his camera out and instead of just letting it roll, like who cares if it takes 20 minutes? I mean, you're just gonna speed through it and get to the explosion. He thought he would time it. And he was a split second too late on the trigger. And instead of hearing, boom, like that, with a flash, because it was at night, all you heard was, boom. Because <laughs> he got like, literally, as long as it, you know, the sound of kaboom, you know, K-A-B-O-O-M, all he got was O-M, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> and the shot was lost. So that was one extreme at one end. The opposite was another guy who was, a, and I, I won't mention any names, but well, his name is Mike MacArthur. And, uh, He's a brilliant cameraman. And years ago um, at the CNE, there was a terrible plane crash as part of the air show. And the British Nimrod jet uh, just didn't get out of a, do uh, didn't pull out of a turn uh, fast enough and it smashed right into Lake Ontario and everybody was killed. Well, his job that day was to go out and shoot video for the air show. So it's pretty generic stuff in one sense. You know, you know, you want to get the snowbirds, you want to get this, you want to get that, put it all together. And there's your video report for the, uh, the air show. So he was rolling and recording and he thought he got all of the shots. He was shooting the Nimrod and he thought he got all of the shots that he needed. And he turned around to walk away, but something told him to keep his camera rolling. And as he started to turn, he heard this woman go, oh no, like that, oh no. And he, without just split second reacting, he just spun the camera around and he was the only one to get the video of the Nimrod crashing into Lake Ontario. And um, because it took after the woman shouted out and other people gasped because they, they all, you know, various people could tell, okay, he's too low, he's not gonna get out of this. And um, because of that heads up thought on, on Mike's part, um, he got the video. So. You know, people, after they see this, they can literally go to YouTube and go Nimrod, you know, plane crash, CNE, and uh, you'll see the Little City TV logo. And that was because Mike decided to just keep rolling, even though he was literally had the camera turned away and all that was being picked up uh, was, you know, asphalt because he was carrying the camera away from the shot. A lot of good memories. Yeah, for sure. And that, 
that last story, that takes a lot of awareness to be able to do that that quickly, too. Cameras no, aren't light. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're much lighter they're, now. Than, yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, that's still... I remember talking with the guys, you know, at City, and they would say that they he had a very, very generous health plan at City. And that was like 100% coverage. So who has that wow. today in, in the corporate world? <clears throat> but um, the camera guys were always appreciative of the fact that we had a very generous uh, physiotherapy program. And because, you know, lugging those 60 pound cameras on the one shoulder all the time, you know, four, five hours a day, uh, it, you know, it wears on you. And so they, guys had, and women had chronic back issues, shoulder issues, neck issues. And uh, so they made use of the physio. Definitely. So j just to touch on the disability awareness factor. So yeah. you, you were one of Canada's first on-air personalities with yeah. a disability. And I remember seeing a story where you said, I want people to see my mobility scooter in the shot. Yeah. Cause yeah. I want them to see, you know, that disabled people yeah. can do things too. What was it like knowing you were, you were one of the pioneers for disabled people on TV in Canada? Well, it was not something I came to immediately. And I, I'll be completely honest. Um, one of the trepidations that I had, I mean, I knew I had to, when, Moses Neimer, uh, you mentioned CKO radio at the very beginning of our conversation here. And um, most people have forgotten CKO. A lot of really, really talented people went through that place, but it was terribly managed to the, by and large. And, you know, we used to joke that we were ranked 15th in a, in a market of 14 uh, radio stations. And, uh, but Moses Neimer saw me hosting an event uh, at the Science Center, where two astronauts came in. This is 19, early 1984, and that was a big deal in 1984 to have two astronauts, one of whom was a Canadian, come to show space shuttle video. And so the Science Center's theater jammed, absolutely jammed with people to uh, come and watch this. What I didn't know was that he was so impressed with the work that I did as the MC that evening, because it was sponsored by CKO, uh, that he decided to hire me. So many months went by until an opening came and he offered me the position. I thought he was calling me to see about something completely different because a friend of mine and myself had submitted a, a, a concept idea of a TV show, which never went anywhere. Um, except when I got there to Moses' office, you know, and he offered me the position of doing the weather, I, I was just flabbergasted. I, I honestly didn't know what to say, except he then said, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote you the exact numbers, because I mean, it's a long time ago, so it's, but it's still all relative. I was making $20,000 a year at CKO. Um, half of that was from a government grant uh, given to the station for hiring people with disabilities. Um, when I got to see Moses at City TV, in that first conversation, he said, I, I hope you'll accept. He says, I, I'm sorry, we can't offer you any more money than we can, but if 40,000 a year is acceptable to you, uh, we can start. So I'm going, in my mind, I'm sitting there and I'm going, okay, I've just had my salary doubled. <laughs> you know, I haven't gone anywhere. I'm just, and I get to do the weather. I get to be on TV. So I tried to pretend I was calm and cool and nonchalant, but inside I was going, you know, wee ha, <laughs> this is great. So, um, when I, I left the, his office and I said, this is on a Friday night, a rainy Friday night in November of 1984, um, my wife was singing at the time. She was a country music singer and she was down in, in uh, the Maritimes at that point. And I said, well, I need to talk to my wife first, but um, don't offer it to anybody else. I'll, I'll let you know first thing Monday morning. I just need to talk to her. And so he said, yeah, sure, fine. So as I, I got home and, it, and, you know, no cell phones back then. And you had to place a call and figure out where they were and, you know, try to track them down. And so there's a lot of time to think about it. And as I started to think about it, I thought, well, wait a minute, City TV, you know, everybody's walking around and they're, you know, complete ground up shots. And I was feeling quite anxious about that, to be seen as a person with a disability. 
Um, at the time, I didn't use a scooter. I used uh, my cane and long neck braces. I still use the braces to walk, still use a cane, but I didn't use a, a scooter. And um, so, but my, I got encouragement from my family saying, no, you got to do it, you know, do it. So I called Moses Monday morning and off I went. What I didn't really realize was that the camera people were shooting me from the waist up and the shots. So it was not possible to really determine, unless you had a really keen eye, um, it was not possible to determine that this was a person with a pretty significant physical disability. Until right. about four months into the job, um, we have lineup meeting uh, every afternoon. All, every newsroom has a lineup meeting where they go through, especially if you're putting together an evening telecast. And um, so Moses, uh, did not often come into lineup meetings. I don't remember that he ever did. And uh, so in the middle of the meeting, he came in and I, I was at my workstation in the, the weather set, and uh, which was in, in the newsroom, the old building at 99 Queen East. And um, Moses interrupts and he says, I, I want you all to meet the newest member of the City Pulse team. And everyone was looking at him and looking at him in the doorway, thinking that he was bringing somebody new into the room because that's what he would do. He did the hiring. There's no HR department back then. I mean, you know, you'd see the right person and talk to them and hire them. So he said, um, I want you all to meet David Onley. And I looked at my colleagues because I've now been there for four or five months and I know them, they know me, there's no introduction needed. And he says, the reason I'm doing this introduction and I said, uh, when I watch the news, I only see David from the waist up. I don't see him from the ground up. So he said, David's a member of the City Pulse team. Uh, I want to see him shot from the ground up. And if anybody calls the station and wants to know why he's using a cane, well, we better have the answer ready for them. <laughs> and so he said, everyone have that? And the news direct news producer for the day, late Clint Nickerson, a great, great guy. I learned a ton of information from him. He just said, got it, Moses. Thank you. Will do. You know, he, like, he immediately responded to it. And so literally the switchboard was given just this little note that you know, Mr. Onley uses long leg braces. He had polio and he uses a uh, cane to steady himself. So what would happen then is that after a number of months, um, I realized that people were recognizing me. And to start up a conversation, they would say something that initially to me sounded really dumb because they would say, so what's the weather like? And, you know, I would, you know, look around and see that it was bright and sunny. And uh, I would want to say something sarcastic of, you know, it, it's, it's raining. What do you think it is, you know? But my wife, Ruth Ann, corrected me quite promptly and efficiently, if you will, by saying, all they really didn't want to do is talk. It's, it's not that, you know, they're not really asking what the weather is. So I went, huh, you know what, she's absolutely right. So from that point on, before I went out anywhere in the years that I did the weather, which was over five years, um, I always made sure I knew what the forecast was. Low tonight, weather conditions, high tomorrow, what it was going to be like. And if it was a Friday night, I'd know what the weekend forecast was. So then when people would come up to me and say, hey, you know, you're the guy at City TV, what's the weather like? And I'd say, uh, low tonight, 22, high tomorrow, 31, mostly sunny, get the sunblock, you know? And it's, oh, wow, that's amazing. But what I also didn't realize, I started to realize at that point, was that a goodly number of people in school scooters, wheelchairs, etc., were making eye contact with me and, you know, like a thumbs up or some kind of acknowledgement. And I realized, ah, okay, there's a whole group of people out there that are seeing someone like themselves, if you will. And of course, that was uh, what Moses Neimer, that was his whole approach, was to, um, and coincidentally, prior to this interview, a couple of days ago, I was reading about the history of City TV, uh, maybe in anticipation of what you might ask. And it was Moses' determination, determination that City, City, City Pulse City would Pulse reflect, reflect um, um, the, the, uh, the nature of the society. And, and that's 
you know, that's in truth what it did. You know, if you think back to those early days of City TV, we had the first Asian reporter, the first black reporter, the first indigenous person reporter, the first gay, the first person with HIV, um, and the first person with a disability um, to be seen on air because not all people in our society are blonde, blue-eyed, and in perfect physical health. Hello, <laughs> but you know, today you flip around any station and at six o'clock, uh, or any time of the day, and you're gonna see a whole mixture of people. It wasn't like that in the mid 80s or early 80s, it wasn't. You know, most of the stations, it was, you know, Caucasian males and Caucasian females and a lot of blonde hair. Um, and, uh, you know, it's all changed the, uh, because of the, the whole city TV experience. Definitely, and, and you don't, you really don't see in, in, in that many, you do see a lot of cultures, but disabled people, you just don't really see on TV, and it, it, right. it is rare. Yeah, it, and, and I think that to me, because I started at City TV in December of, uh, December of 1984, um, it's still, it's shocking to me that, you know, here we are all these years later, and um, we still don't see many at all. I'd be hard pressed to think of a single person right now that I see on either CBC, CTV, for that matter, City TV. Um, you know, you just don't. There are a number of individuals I know who are on radio, which is why I started off in radio, because I didn't think there was a way that I was going to get on television, because I didn't see anyone with a disability. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I've talked to people at the radio, television, arts uh, programs about this. You know, people with disabilities don't see themselves on TV, so they don't apply. And if they don't apply, then you don't have a, a, a pipeline of uh, quality individuals coming out. The same thing has happened in the legal profession, where they made the commitment, uh, Legal Leaders for Diversity, LLD, uh, Ken Fredine, a, a great guy at Deloitte, He's the one that started that initiative to encourage uh, people to hire lawyers with disabilities. It was quickly pointed out that one of the problems was not because they didn't want to, but there just weren't that many coming out of law school. And so uh, a newer initiative was begun to encourage people in grade nine to start thinking about a legal career, if not a lawyer, than a law clerk or some other capacity within the legal justice system. And um, so, you know, it's, it's still a tough scenario because television is a very, very visual, by definition, it's a visual medium. And, you know, it's part of this, this whole thing that our society is going through right now in terms of racism and ableism. Um, and that is if you don't see one of your people, quote unquote, in a given context, you just don't think about, well, then maybe I shouldn't be there. You don't think that you should be there or that you have the right to be there. And so that's that's the big nut that we have to crack still in our society. I think so, yeah. And I, I last, well, I'd say three weeks ago now, I spoke with Caroline Casey, the disability advocate from Ireland. And she said like, yes. we need to just start putting it out there. just use your voice and and yeah. make people aware that you know what just because you're disabled doesn't mean you can't apply and i even yeah. talked to david shannon another order of canada yeah. member yeah. lawyer who is a quadriplegic and it's just it's yeah. great yeah. to see people doing that um just so i have a little segment here in the middle of my interviews i call rapid fire where i just ask sure. random questions okay with and it might answers. be a little hard don't worry okay. Don't necessarily emphasize on the rapid part because a lot of okay. people have trouble with it. Um, well, first, and you can give me a few if you want, because a lot of people have said that I, they could offend some people with this question. Who is your favorite person from Ontario? Wow, what a question. Other than my wife, right? Yes, but we'll, okay. we'll, we'll say your wife's number one just for some yes. brownie points. Yes, absolutely. Definite brownie points. That's a really good question. So many uh, talented, uh, dignified individuals. Um, 
I can't narrow it down to one person. I would say uh, Reverend Peter Holmes of York Minster Park Baptist Church in Toronto and my former chief of staff at the legislature at the Lieutenant Governor's Office, uh, Anthony Hilton. That's their one and two. Awesome. I like that. I like that for sure. What's your favorite thing to eat? <laughs> favorite thing to eat. Okay. <laughs> and, and that can either be good for you or not good for you, right? It doesn't so, matter whatever you're doesn't matter. One is. Okay. Coconut cream pie. Definitely in the not good for you category, but uh, just love it. That's okay. So obviously you do like sports as we've, yeah. we've discussed in the past and today if you could be any athlete living or dead for 24 hours who would you choose wow great question um okay i'll default back to johnny bauer uh in the spring of 1967 when the leafs last won the stanley cup and i was not even 17 at that point so that's a that good one, one day, sure. one game. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and that's that's one memory that I hope I hope we can win a cup sometime soon. Yes. For sure. And I'll take this year. If it has to be this year, I don't care what people I say about yeah. it doesn't <laughs> count. It it counts. It definitely counts. At least what? we know the playoffs are gonna be in Toronto this year. <laughs> exactly. And Edmonton. I'm I'm glad yes. it's in Canada yeah. for sure. Yeah. What is your proudest accomplishment in, in life, just in general, just something that you are oh. very proud of? Wow. Raising three sons, Ruth and myself, three sons who are happily married and uh, five grandchildren. So, yeah, awesome. I mean, everything else is just business, you know. That's very true. And last question, I just wanted to know this. What was one of what? What's one of the more funny things that happened when you were lieutenant governor of Ontario? Wow. Okay, I'll tell something I've never told ever, um, but I'll tell it to you. Um, we were. I won't say what city. We were going to an event. Uh, we stayed at a hotel. It's a very good hotel, and. Um, uh, for whatever reason, they gave us two adjacent rooms, like connected rooms, which was great because it meant that my wife could use one washroom to get ready and I could use the other. And um, so I forget why I was looking for something, but uh, just before we're getting ready to leave and the two OPP officers were outside uh, the room, just, just waiting for us to just say, okay, we're coming out. I mean, it was like that close to being ready to leave to go to this dinner. And I opened up a bedside table and uh, the drawer like between the beds. And uh, shall we say there was a certain kind of assistive device in the drawer, certainly uh, anatomically correct, if I can also be precise. <laughs> and we both just started to laugh and called the OPP in. And the officer who had a great sense of humor he, we, ever now all four of us are laughing, and he said, well, I can tell you the Gideons did not put that there, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so we, you know, eventually just, he, uh, he grabbed the towel, threw it out, and um, we eventually told the, uh, the staff then the next day uh, what had been discovered, but uh, that was easily just the, the craziest, craziest moment. Uh, you know, it's, the, it's definitely time. funny, and, and that is yeah. a great sense of humor, for sure. Well, especially being religious yourself, I'm sure it was yeah. just, it, it's hilarious, well, I mean, it really is. Yeah, I mean, you just go, have, I, I, the, when the first officer came in, he, he opened it up, and he, he laughed. Then he called the other guy in, and the other officer, <laughs> and he, by this time, he it's, it's shoved the drawer shut. And the second officer thought there was going to be like one of those spring-loaded snakes or something that was going to jump out. <laughs> and, no, no, it's not a snake. And <laughs> so there we are. Well, that's definitely a good story. And it's one you've never told before. So I like no, that. No. <laughs> so I'm just going to go back into the questions here. Yeah. And th this is what I was most excited about to ask you about because I met yeah. you when you were in the job. So you were Lieutenant yes, Governor yeah. of Ontario. Yeah. I don't remember for how long. Can, can you just give me the years? Seven I think years. it was 2000. 
seven years. 2007, okay. Yeah, 2007 to 2014. Okay, because I knew it was 07, and I knew I met yeah. you in 2009 Nine? Nine? spring. Okay. Um, so you were sworn in on September 5th. However, you were informed on July 4th, 2007. And yeah. I think it's a great story to share. When you were driving, the prime minister called you. Can you just talk me through the, the yes. phone call? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I knew that the call was coming because I would received word that he was going to call. Um, and uh, when I got the word that he was going to call, they would not tell me what it was about, but I knew from discussing with the appointment secretary six days earlier that the call would come within seven days, and this was day six. And I also knew that that meant that I had the position because um, a prime minister does not call people up to tell them they've lost. He has people, to his staff to do that. So it was, Soon, as soon as I knew that he was going to be calling me, then I also knew that I was about to be appointed Lieutenant Governor. So uh, I said to them, um, I, was, I was getting ready to do my homepage show, which is on Wednesdays. And uh, it ran from five to 10 to six. And uh, it was a somewhat rainy day in Toronto. And the typical drive home for me takes 40 minutes. I did back then from Queen Street out to where we lived near the zoo in Scarborough. And um, so I said to them, well, I have to go on the air right now. Can, could he put the call through into the here? And they, the guy said, oh, absolutely not. He says, I'm not going to have the prime minister calling into a newsroom. And I went, well, that was kind of a dumb thing for me to say on them. Oh. Said, I said, well, look, the show ends at 10 to 6. I will get in my car. I will get home as quickly as I can. Here's my cell phone number. And, um, and so the show ended and I just booted it out of there and got into the car and headed home thinking that it was going to be an even longer drive than normal, but it wasn't. And I'd been told by the guy, the appointment secretary, a gentleman by the name of Dave Penner, who now works uh, at Canada Post. He's in charge of communications and public relations. And he said, well, the prime minister has to get, catch a flight to go to Nova Scotia this, this evening. So, you know, it, it'll be when he has time to call. I said, well, okay, you know, I'm not gonna argue with the guy at that point. So when I um, ended the, the show, the homepage show, which was, I loved, I loved doing it, uh, hosting it and producing it. Uh, I would always end off by saying uh, a, sp a thank you to our guests and I would rattle the name of the guests and uh, for the entire crew and uh, to all of you for just watching. Uh, we'll see you next week. So that was the way I ended it every single week. Except this time, I ended off by saying, and that's this edition of uh, Homepage, I'm David Onley. It has been a pleasure because I knew I wasn't going to be back on the air. So they told me as soon as it was public, that was it. I was not going to be on the air. So a couple of my crew members, I could see floor director, he, they, they looked at each other because, you know, for five years, they'd heard me sign off with the identical phrase and uh, they knew something was up. So now we, I'm in the car, I'm driving home and I find, I, unbelievably, even though it had been rainy, there were very few cars on the road. And I got almost all the way home until I got to the top of the Don Valley Parkway and I'm about to make the turn to head east on the 401. And at that point, you could only, you could either go collector or uh, express lanes. I chose the express lanes. The phone rang and it was the secretary saying, you know, is this Mr. David Onley? I said, yes. And uh, does I have the prime minister on the phone for you? Uh, please stand by. Yes. <laughs> you know, what? you can say, no, no, I'm busy right now. Um, and so I started to drive and on came Stephen Harper. And uh, at that point, I'm just going like, I can't believe it. I am driving along the 401 and there's no place to pull over at that point. The shoulders are very narrow and uh, I'm just saying this, you know, silent prayer of Lord, don't let me leave the lane. Don't let me hit anybody. Don't let anyone hit me, you know. Meanwhile, trying to carry on a, a conversation with the Prime Minister and uh, he said, I think I, you know why I'm calling and I said, yes sir, I believe I do and he said, well, 
I, I still need to ask you, we'd like to appoint you as Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, would, would you be willing to accept? And I said, yes, absolutely, thank you. And uh, he said, well, that's good, that's great. And then we just chatted a little bit from that point. And the rest of the trip, I don't remember at all. It only took about five, seven minutes max to get from uh, uh, the top of the 401 to the top of the DVP to uh, our exit at uh, Meadowvale. So I got off at Meadowvale. I'm wrapping up the conversation as I am about to turn onto our street. And I'm hitting southbound on Shepherd to turn uh, westbound onto our street. And I see this yellow Volkswagen making a left-hand turn in front of me to go onto the street. And I recognize it as one of the neighbors from up the street. And I, I wasn't at that point, we, we still had about, we're into that kind of, okay, thanks very much. It's been great chatting with you, that type of conversation. You know, it's all wrapping up in 15 seconds. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to cut in front of her. And I just waved at her to keep on going. And she waved back with a smile. And the thought went through my mind as I said, thank you very much, sir, and uh, have a great day. I thought she has absolutely no idea that right now her neighbor is talking with the prime minister of the country <laughs> and then um, pulled into the driveway and there was the family. So there we are. Yeah, it's definitely a cool story and definitely uh, <laughs> not expected to be while you're driving, but just I no. could not imagine how proud you were of yourself. Like, yeah. holy uh, crap, I just talked to the prime minister of Canada. Oh, do, yeah. you still, do you still talk to Stephen Harper ever? No, um, be uh, very candid. I have not talked to him in uh, uh, a couple of years, frankly. And uh, so I'm not sure why I've lost video here for us, but oh, there we are. But um, no, I haven't uh, talked to him in, uh, you know, since he left office. But uh, it's not, you know, candidly, it's not the type of position that, uh, you know, it's not political. So there, you know, frankly, wouldn't be a specific reason. That, uh, right. I, I would be speaking to him. But it's Definitely. been a real pleasure. Uh, I, I thank you very much for uh, taking, you know, this oppor giving me this opportunity to chat. Yeah, for sure. And I, ju I just have, I have a few more questions, just so you know. There's a, okay. there's a few things. You have the time, right? I'm not, I'm not cutting I in anything. Just, I just have a few minutes, actually. So. Uh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll make the last question here a little bit, okay. just to wrap up. So you use your position as Lieutenant Governor to raise awareness for, you know, the disabled community, yep. remove barriers and whatnot, and just to relate it to present day. So obviously with COVID, it's a little hard yep. for a lot of people, especially the disabled community. But yep. w what are some of the things that you, you know, what, what were some of the things that you want to, you wanted to change when you were in office and how, how can we keep the awareness going for the disabled community? Just to like mix the question a little bit. Right. Well, I, I think the two are tied together. I mean, I always talk about employment opportunities for people with disabilities. And uh, I, I spoke about that for seven years uh, during my term. I, I think the thing now is as, as we look at the, at the situation with uh, COVID, um, as I touched on briefly earlier, um, Everyone wants to get back to normal, but we cannot go back to normal because normal is not good enough. Normal is what's gotten us into this mess in the first place. If the governments of Ontario, Quebec, and the federal government had done what the governments in the Maritime, specifically the government of Nova Scotia did, um, we would not have the number of fatalities that we do in this country. If we had the same statistics that uh, New Brunswick did, um, we would have something, the grand total death toll in our country would be something in the neighborhood of 200 odd people instead of 8,600. Within that group of people, the vast majority are persons with disabilities. Um, people with disabilities have been put to the bottom rung in terms of employment opportunities, uh, health, opportunities, health coverage, uh, housing, um, we have been the expendables, if you will. Not deliberately, nobody is saying that, but by a kind of benign neglect of seniors, 
because people don't like to confront the idea of getting old and therefore, and then getting closer to death. People don't like to do that. So it's easier to just shove people off into homes. People have a difficult time in coping with those with disabilities because anything less than physical perfection is what is, is not held up in our society as, as anything of value. Um, and so somehow we have to change that dialogue. Somehow, somehow we have to change that conversation. And I, and I think insofar as the homes are concerned, insofar as personal support workers are concerned, um, we have to do better. We can do what the Japanese have done to provide for people in their last years. Um, we can realize that PSWs are hugely important in our hierarchy of, of medical treatment, uh, that they should not be at the bottom. They are now. They're not adequately trained in many instances. They don't have the resources that uh, they need. And because of all of that, we have 80% of the 8,600 plus people uh, who have died have been seniors and seniors with disabilities and persons with disabilities. And the vast majority of them completely needless. So a hard, hard conversation has to take place uh, about what we're gonna be doing going forward. And uh, it's not gonna be an easy conversation, but we have to have it. We, you know, uh, I think if there's any benefit to what's been occurring in terms of the discussions about racism, um, and which is a valuable conversation to have. It's a, it's a necessary debate, let's put it that way, to have. Um, because so much of it, I, I, I really believe, is not willful, but it, it's a benign neglect. It's a, um, it's a subtle thing. Well, so is ableism. Ableism is a nasty, nasty attitude that affects the vast majority of persons with disabilities. And uh, it's subtle, but it's real. And it's what creates barriers for people with disabilities. And somehow we have to have that conversation to address that. And so, you know, there's, there's over 5,900 words in the English language that end in ISM, an ism. Many of them have to do with medical conditions. Right near the top of the list, alphabetically, are ableism and ageism. And the two, obviously, they begin with the letter A, but ableism is before ageism, but they're right there, right at the top. And I think, you know, we need to be having a combined conversation of ableism, ageism, and racism, because the, it's the attitudes that people have that have triggered this. And it starts when kids are small. And if you're taught, as, as I was taught, that there's no difference between people because, because of color, there's no difference between people because of where they, what country they came from, or what, um, you know, um, uh, what language they speak. That's what, that's what we were taught as kids. Um, you know, then that's what I grew up thinking. And uh, unfortunately, the opposite is true. You know, if a, if a person is taught to discriminate, they discriminate. And they don't even necessarily think it's wrong. And that's the part that is really tough, so. Definitely, and that's exactly why I have these conversations. And thank you so much for your time today, David. I really do appreciate it. It's been an absolute privilege. And uh, Clayton, keep up the good work. And um, I'm glad you're, I gave you that award. and I'm, so glad that you're deserving of it so <laughs> yes thank you very much you have yourself a good one and i'll uh, i'll be sure to send a link out when it's posted i really appreciate it take care all right you too david thanks so much bye bye bye